It's good to be back tonight. Uh, we certainly enjoy being with you this week. I had a great time of fellowship with the pastor tonight at the Mexican restaurant up the street. I presume everybody knows the name of that. And uh, it's wonderful. We even have some leftovers that we'll enjoy after the service. Also, uh, there was someone in the church that made us a wonderful apple pie. And we have been very patient uh, in digging into that. And so as a family, we will enjoy so after the service. And so we're eager for that. Uh, but at this time, uh, my son Jonathan and my wife are going to sing a song that Jonathan wrote with his mother uh, here about uh, a half a year ago or so. And Jonathan's heart is just so burdened uh, that, that God uh, would help those who are hurting and those who are suffering. And this song that uh, the Lord used him to write with his mother is entitled, He's Always There. Much. Tremendous, tremendous. I appreciate that. And at this time, all the children may be dismissed uh, to the kids' revival service. Uh, you may be dismissed and things and go have a wonderful time tarring and feathering the worker and all of that kind of stuff and pulling all sorts of shenanigans and whatnot. But anyway, um, as they're doing that, I wanted to mention some of the things off of our table. I know many of you have stopped by. Uh, the most important thing you could do for us is grab one of our prayer cards and pray for us as a family as we crisscross the country together as a team uh, 10 months out of the year. Uh, 
Uh, we've been traveling for 14 years, and it just it feels like a breeze. It feels like yesterday the Lord uh, had us launch out into the deep, and it's just so wonderful to see all that God has done over these past handful of years. But grab one of these prayer cards. If you'd be so kind, if you do put it on the fridge, you could put the magnet right there. And so, <laughs> and those of you that are familiar with the layout of the card, you know exactly whose face I'm covering up, all right? And there's also prayer requests on the back that we specifically have written uh, in which we desire for you to uh, seek the Lord about for us. Also on the back table, there's a sign-up sheet. I know some of you here are on uh, our prayer team and receive our prayer texts. Uh, but if you'd like to receive a uh, mass prayer text uh, to our prayer team that you'll get individually, nobody gets your number, uh, but you could join with us in praying for revival and for God's spirit to have great liberty, his word to have free course, for the Lord Jesus Christ to be exalted and magnified. And uh, for the Lord to have great, great liberty in all the meetings and services. Uh, we have uh, now a little over a thousand people on that praying and seeking the Lord. And I pray that God ever increases that. Over a thousand people right now praying for this service tonight. Amen. And uh, faithful people and wonderful people that are burdened for God to do a work, uh, whatever he so desires. Also, uh, on the table, our gospel film cards. I know several of you have uh, uh, grabbed these and we have thousands of them. So feel free to grab a stack, pass them out to your co-workers if you have blessing to do so and all those things a great evangelistic tool um, and also these are uh, available to customize for churches so that way the church information can be there on the back we were talking a little bit about the gospel film at dinner um, and a couple years ago the Lord allowed us to begin in January of 2021 the gospel film project a nonprofit organization in which all the funds that come in from churches that support it individuals that even give to it uh, and businesses that support it all of the money that comes into that uh, is directly used for the furtherance of the gospel. There's no salaries, there's no overhead cost in that regard, uh, simply but for translation of the film into other languages, getting the film uh, audibly done where the voiceover work is done but a I would say 95% of the money that comes in goes toward the boosting of this film on social media and the film now has reached over 130 million people uh, in over 80 countries on the earth Please pray, because that's just a drop in the bucket. Amen. And I believe, and we'll get more into this, Lord willing, on Thursday night, as God will give us utterance and free course, I believe that it's humanly possible to reach every single person with the gospel in our lifetime. Why would God give the Great Commission if he knew it was something that could not be accomplished? Rather, I believe he's given us this Great Commission, he's given us this calling, because he knows it's something that can be done, not in human strength, not by physical might, but rather, by His Spirit, it can be done. Whosoever will. Amen. And if the gospel was not for everybody, if the gospel was not for everybody, I don't believe that if it wasn't, that as a church, that it would be unattainable. And I'm concerned that we as Christians, we view it, well, there's just so many people to reach. It is, it is overwhelming. We can't do it in our own strength, but we can do it through God's strength and God's power. I want to see what God can do in my lifetime. Amen? Amen. And other resources back there, we won't take the time to talk about that, CDs and, and various books and materials that I believe will be a great help, and many of you have already looked through those things, and of course that will be up all week. My wife and I are going to sing a song entitled, I Can Pray. We'll open our Bibles back to Acts chapter number 4, verse number 31, getting into our text tonight here in just a few moments. Shows no interest, my child has gone. 
can pray. We can pray. I can God desires for his church to be a house of prayer. We focused on that on Sunday night, and specifically taking the time to notice what the Bible promises there in James 5, 16. We're encouraged by the promise. We're edified by the principle, of course, of what we find in that text, that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. By the way, aren't you thankful that it only takes one man, singular? What could God do if it was men? People combined, an entire church, of course, that were radically desiring to see God uh, break open, if you will, the portals of glory and rain out the blessing, the torrential downpour of heaven in our lives and in our families, our homes, in our community, in our churches. And as our text says, and when they had prayed, the place was shaken. And the Bible taught us there in James 5, 16, the very simple truths, but yet profound and convicting truths to my heart. Number one, we must pray. Number two, we must pray with persistence. Seek the Lord until the answer comes. We must pray with passion. We must pray with a pure heart, pure mind, pure body. Uh, a righteous man availeth much. This next song uh, that I'm going to sing and then transition into the message tonight as we continue forward in studying these various attributes of being a first century church, a Bible church, a biblical church in a 21st century world. This song here is derived from Psalm 139. Most of the lyrics come, direct quotation of Scripture in that passage. Uh, it's entitled, Search Me, O God. And there in Psalm 139, the psalmist is so overwhelmed with God's delight in him, God creating him, how that God desires to be involved in the intricacies of his life, that God knew every single moment he sat down and when he stood up, everything. He knew the thoughts and all the things that we'll talk about uh, throughout this song. But at the end of the chapter, he becomes overwhelmed in his spirit, saying, oh God, kind of like Isaiah had the experience in Isaiah 6. Wow, look at God. Whoa, look at me. Search me, O God. Try me. Know my heart. See if there be any wicked way in me. I don't want to live a life that grieves you, that insults you. The various things that we studied last night concerning the Holy Spirit that we'll review just in a little while. But God, I want you to lead me in thy way, the way everlasting. have searched me, you have known me, you're acquainted with my ways. You have laid your hand upon me, heard my thoughts from far away. In the night time or the light, I'm just as visible to you. this knowledge is and how I need you to search me oh God and know my heart try me oh God know my anxiety great is the sum of them. In your book were the days you had for me, when as yet there was none. 
one of them. I will praise you, for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. My soul knows well how skillful is the one to whom I pray. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Try me, O oh God, know my anxiety. See if there be dwell in the farthest sea. Even there your hand will hold me. Search me We know tonight that this is a prerequisite for revival. As we mentioned last night, the root of revival is repentance. Our hearts, our minds, our lives thoroughly right with Him. And as we preached in Sunday morning, I'm just trying to connect the dots and remind us of things, be stirred by way of remembrance as the Bible encourages us. We don't do these things because we have to. We need to, but we don't do it because we have to. We do it because we get to. We're motivated, we're moved in our spirit, in the very fiber of our being because of his love for us and our love for him. Everything, as the Bible says, the love of Christ constraineth us. And as we observed at the very end of the message Sunday morning concerning what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us from 1 John chapter number 3, that we come to this conclusion, you know what, I refuse to lower myself and roll around the muck and the mire of this whole world because I'm in love with Jesus too much. But we have a carnal nature and we have that flesh that rages within. We have various adversaries about, but we have one within. The old devil, he fights his tooth and nail. The world laughs in our face and that corrupt cultural system that we call the world is contrary to the things that we find with the biblical worldview. But then we've also got this heart that is deceitful. 
and desperately wicked, the Bible says. Who can truly know it? Nobody can. And every single one of us in here, and I don't even want to meditate on it, let's just skip past it, but every single one of us in here are capable of performing and engaging in the darkest abominations known to the human race. Every single one of us. Your heart is deceitful tonight. To the very point that some could be sitting here this evening saying, oh no, I could never do it. You're deceived. In my flesh dwells no good thing. I need victory over my flesh. That's why we need to be filled with the Spirit. Because if we're filled with the Spirit, we will not be filled with self. You cannot be filled with the Spirit and with the flesh at the same time. We must die to self, as Paul exhorted and as he testified concerning himself. I die daily. We must live a crucified life. Why does Jesus want you to take up a cross and follow him? So you can be nailed to it. So you can be crucified upon it. So you can die, as the Bible says. Let's go ahead and keep your finger there in Acts chapter number 4. That's the foundation of where we're at this week. And I, I love how the Lord is having us in this one text. It doesn't happen very often. It's very rare. I think the last time we even preached out of Acts chapter number 4 was back in October or September of last year. And so uh, it's wonderful. I like it when we're able to dig down deep in a text. But join with me. There's a verse that popped into my mind. Uh, let's see here. And I'm going to try to run ahead there first before I give you the reference. Colossians chapter number 3. Colossians chapter number three and we actually reference this in the Sunday morning service concerning that thought and that principle of living life in the light of eternity being consumed and concentrated upon not the earthly or the temporal but the heavenly and the spiritual the Bible says in Colossians 3 verse number one it says if ye then be risen with Christ seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. That's pretty cut and dry, isn't it? <laughs> There's no way to be able to pull apart that text and live any way else. Amen, church? The Bible says, notice uh, in verse number 5, jumping right to it, as God is trying to teach us how Christ can be our life and how we can live the Spirit-filled life and the Christ-centered life and the crucified life. Uh, notice the Bible says in verse number 5, launching out of the gate, he says it very clearly. There is no dodging it. He says, you and I, we need to mortify our members. Every single part of our body. Every body part, every single thing concerning our mind, our spirit, our attitudes, our character, the makeup of who we are uh, with our body, soul, and spirit that we will mortify. This word mortify means to make dead, to put to death, to slay and execute. Every single morning when Caleb Garraway wakes up out of the bed, he must die to self. I must be crucified with Christ. Would you join with me to the book of Romans, chapter number 6. Romans, chapter number 6, and all these things will dovetail together tonight. I'm very excited about how the Lord is giving wisdom to be, be able to make these things uh, flow, uh, Lord willing. And uh, we see here in Romans, chapter number 6, some wonderful verses, some wonderful verses concerning the crucified life. Romans, chapter number 6, notice specifically here at verse number 6, Romans 6, verse number 6. The Word of God teaches us, knowing this, that our old man, what's the next word after man? Now help me out tonight. Is this a past tense word, a present tense word, or a future tense word? Present. I'm 36 years old. If the Lord tarries his... Who whistled when I said that? <laughs> Are you kidding me right now? Okay. Man, <laughs> I like that. Please don't do it again. <laughs> but if the Lord chairs is coming and he allows me to live twice my age to 72, when I open up Romans chapter number 6 and verse number 6 and I read it, it's always and ever going to remain in the present tense. That means I need this truth right now in this very moment of my life. And I'm also going to need it 36 years later from now. 
Every single one of us, whether we're young, we're aged, doesn't matter who you are tonight, you've been saved for six months or maybe it's been 45 years, the Word of God exhorts us and admonishes us, encourages us to live a life that is crucified. The old man, our flesh, ever present tense, nailed, if you will, to the cross that we're supposed to bear daily and carry following our Lord Jesus Christ to wherever he would lead us in his will, engage in his work. Knowing this, do you know that tonight? We all know that two plus two is four. That's common sense theology, right? There's no other way that I can try to convince you that two plus two is three, right? You know this to be fact. So should we be convinced of this truth. Just as common sense knowledge and it's obvious, well, duh, yeah, this is how we should function as people, that it's not up for debate. It's not up for, well, let me go ahead and ponder to see if I'm actually going to be yielded to the Lord today and live a crucified life and allow the Spirit of God to fill me. No, it's common sense theology. I will be crucified. It's easier said than done. But still, it needs to be said. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. Do you want victory? The only way it's possible is not through our own strength. It's not through a program. It's not through this, that, or the other. And God may use uh, various attributes or various pointers and things to help you on the journey. But the only way that you're ever going to get victory is in the Lord Jesus Christ. The only way you're going to get victory is through the power of the Holy Spirit of God and his presence uh, indwelling you and filling you and flowing through you. And the Lord Jesus Christ as well, uh, working and enabling you in your life as he seeks to live through you as well, according to Galatians 2.20. It's wonderful to consider that the entire Trinity wants to be involved in your day-to-day -day existence God's he's very busy he's in charge of the entire universe and my existence is more microscopic than a speck of dust but yet God looks at me and God has created you and me and we are his crowning creation out of everything and he delights to be involved in our lives but we must take the appropriate steps tonight and be willing to die to self. This is how the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. There's a battle raging for control between the flesh and the spirit. If you could put up on the screen Galatians 5.17. Galatians 5.17, which is where we were a little bit last night in the book of Galatians, talking about the fellowship we have with the spirit uh, and living with him and, and walking with him and being led of the spirit. Galatians 5.17, the Bible says, for the flesh lusteth or striveth against the spirit and the spirit, capital S, you see that, right? It's the Holy Spirit of God is seeking to fight against your flesh and my flesh. And these are contrary, the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. you got to pick one or the other. There's no handing, holding your hand to one and the other and trying to make this thing work. Even Jesus, he was trying to help us with a, a different context, different thing. He was talking about God and mammon. Uh, you can't hold your hand with the word of God and with the world and, and function. It just doesn't work, all right? You'll bring yourself to a place of spiritual frustration. You'll be vexed. Like we talked about last night, a uh, lot there uh, where the Bible says as a result of what he saw and what he heard in the midst of a corrupt culture, it vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. And he was never able to go forward. He was never able to grow in his walk with God. He was never able to know the fullness of what God's will was and the work of God of what he could do through his life. Rather, he fled Sodom, losing everything, being a laughing stock to even his own family, barely escaping with the clothes on his back. That's what's going to take place. We'll never have victory and we'll never go forward, never experience a revival. The Spirit of God enabling and anointing and dwelling and all the things that he does, equipping. If we're not yielded to his Spirit, if we're not dying daily and being crucified. I know we're throwing around a lot of terms tonight. And all of this is a scratch in the service, and I'm sure over the years pastor has preached on this. And when pastor preaches, pay attention. Amen. He's got something for you that God has given him, and he can't wait to be able to share it with you. The flesh, I face this daily, I'm sure we all do, fighteth against the spirit. The spirit is trying to fight against the flesh, but we must choose who we will allow to be in control. 
The flesh seems to be so dominant and so uh, enraged, if you will, and being something that seems to be so consuming that we just can't get the victory. Well, let's go back to Sunday night. Ask, and you might receive. Knock, and well, well, we'll see. If you knock hard enough, Seek and, well, you got a 10% chance that you'll be the one that finds. No. Everyone that asketh receiveth. You want victory, you can have victory. Let's not overcomplicate the Christian life. What's happening is that the heart is raging within. It's deceitful. It's trying to convince you, no, no, don't live for Jesus. No, don't be crucified. No, uh, don't allow yourself to be filled with the Spirit. No, don't do those things. Why? Because the flesh is something that is lustful. It's dictatorial. It's a vicious adversary hungering to yank you and yank me down and about in its self-willed chains and drag us through, if you will, all the muck and the mire of life and carnality and ultimately bring us into a crippling captivity. It's going to fight you and fight me tooth and nail, kicking and screaming. It doesn't want to be filled with the Spirit. The flesh doesn't want to be controlled. It wants to be in control. The flesh doesn't want to die to self. It wants to dominate. It wants to bring our spirit and our spirit for God down into subjection under its whims and its wants. He doesn't want to be crucified as the Bible teaches. This is how we should live and operate. It wants to claim complete uh, ownership over your existence and ultimately leave no room for God. Now help me out tonight. If I'm not mistaken, according to 1 Corinthians 6, verse number 19, that as God's children, we are to be the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you. Your flesh has no right to claim ownership over something it does not own. You belong to God. Praise the Lord. He deserves that, and we sang, He is worthy. He is worthy of having that ownership. May we yield ourselves unto Him. We all know tonight when a person accepts Jesus Christ as his personal Savior, the Holy Spirit comes and indwells that individual. Every believer is completely given the Spirit of God, according to Ephesians 1, verse number 13 and 14. The question, however, is this. How much of our lives have we completely given to him? Are we daily yielding our all to him? We've been given all the Holy Spirit, but have we given our all to him? The crucified life is to uh, have a life holy and utterly given over to God in complete humility and total obedience. A Christian that says, I yield myself. Of course, this comes through prayer as we find described in our text of Acts 4.31. Let's continue in our study here tonight in Romans chapter number 6. Notice in verse number 12 down to verse number 14, Romans 6, 12 through 14. The Bible says this, let not sin... What's that word let mean? Don't allow it. You have a choice. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves to who, church? God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Verse number 14, for sin shall not have dominion over you. Verse number 16, the Bible says this, know ye not? Come on, think about this with a level head. Don't overcomplicate this thing. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants are, uh, ye are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death. Well, that doesn't sound like revival or of obedience and righteousness. God flourishing and growing and God doing a work in your life. And God is a spirit. He is alive. He quickens and praise God for that tonight. But we must understand, uh, as Christians, as we've said multiple times tonight, we must die to self, yield our members as instruments, as the Bible just taught us, uh, as, as instruments of righteousness under the spirit of God. And allow him to have full control and access over our hearts, minds, and bodies. Of course, 
We've been designed with a free will. It's our choice whether or not we will yield or not yield. Whether we will walk in the flesh or, as we preached last night, walk in the spirit. If we're not careful, we all know this to be true. It doesn't even need to be said. We're all aware of this tonight. But if we're not careful, we can become centered on our own will and our own way. And this is dangerous. Because God warns us twice. He says it in Proverbs 14, 12. He says in Proverbs 16, 25. He says, there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And that's exactly what your flesh and my flesh is seeking to do. This is why we must yield ourselves to God and over to his sweet Holy Spirit. Daily we must decide, God, I want you to have full control. And as the hymn of the faith goes, I surrender most. Sometimes I think that's the word that needs to be sung. Because we're singing all, but we're hypocrites because we're singing one thing but living another. I'm not accusing you of that. I'm accusing myself of it because I've been there and I've done it. And it brings shame and grief to the Holy Spirit. I surrender some. Put the right word in there and stop being a hypocrite. Some even in this room I surrender none. May that not be true of any of us tonight, but rather, as we all know it to be, and it ought to be, what a privilege that we can say in saying, I surrender all. I yield myself. The words directly from the Word of God. I yield, O God. And the more we relinquish our minds and our hearts and our bodies, the more His presence can fill us. This, in turn, will affect our character. Some people say, well, I was just born that way and just who I am, you know, just my personality. Well, that's not an excuse. And don't justify that fleshly attribute. Let God transform you and mold you into his image. And God wants to make you a new creature with the old things being passed away and all these things becoming new. And listen, it'll affect our character. It'll affect our emotions. It will affect our feelings, our words, our thoughts, our decisions, and our actions. And we will begin to see the manifestation and the result of his presence in us. It's called fruit. See, in order to experience and in order to bear the fruit of the Spirit, we must have the filling of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit are impossible without the filling of the Spirit. And we can try to manufacture love and joy and peace, but there's nothing like a heaven-sent love. Nothing like a heaven-sent joy and a peace and something that we know is not just put on, something that we know is not just an act, something that's put as a false front, but rather something that is genuine within that cannot be contained and it's fruit. And when you think about fruit and anybody that's involved in trying to raise things, you know, to get fruit, you're not looking for just one or two measly apples or peaches or lemons on the tree. You want something in which the branch is weighed down and the heaviness of all the overabundance of the fruit that's being brought forth where it's bucket after bucket. Oh, yes. Oh, the harvest is great. I love it. Yes. What about us in our lives? Does that describe you? Is there an overabundance of love and joy and peace and meekness and gentleness and goodness and grace in your life? Or is it hatred, bitterness, grief, critical tongue, bad attitude, etc., etc., etc.? Jesus said, by their fruits ye shall know them. The fruit of the Spirit. That's what this whole world needs. You know, fruit, it's refreshing. My son, Jonathan, who sang tonight, (laughs) he's like, Mom, I need mango. What eight-year-old says that? (laughs) I need mango. Okay. So we bought him a couple mangoes at the store. You know, they're rock hard. (laughs) Break your teeth if you try to eat it. Put it out on the counter, let the sun, you know. Like, what, eight days later, and finally it's like, oh, it's good. It's succulent. It's juicy. It's sweet. It's refreshing. 
Do these attributes describe your life as others are interacting with you? None of it's possible without the Spirit of God. The fruits of the Spirit are a result of His presence in us, becoming manifest throughout our everyday life. So much more could be said here. We're trying to streamline as much as possible. We have somewhere where we're trying to go tonight. The Bible says in Acts chapter number 4, And when they had prayed, house of prayer, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Pray for this filling. Seek, and ye shall find it. God will give it to you. We find that this first century church was a place where it was a habitation of God's presence and power. Of course, last night we alluded to the fact that the Holy Spirit of God and one of his functions is to anoint and empower every believer with the spiritual energy and force to be able to go forth and make a difference. And I love Acts 1.8, and ye shall receive power. The New Testament Greek word is the word uh, dunamis. It's like dynamite. It's explosive. Quench not the spirit. What does that mean? Quenching. It's a fire that goes out. It's something that's there and then it's snuffed and put away. This fire of the Holy Spirit that desires to consume us and burn upon us as it says, and ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come where? Within you. Is that what it says? No, but upon you. I pray tonight that you understand that the presence of God within you is different from the power of God resting upon you. His presence dwells within, uh, and it's an indwelling of the Spirit, but there's also an anointing of the Spirit. I pray that we would not stop at the fullness in which we desire just His presence, but we would go beyond that and tarry until we receive the touch, uh, that we would seek the Lord uh, and be endued with power from on high and have this spizzerinctum and this dunamis, if you will, to be able to go forward and go out. Listen, there's many Christians that are growing weary and well-doing, but listen, it's not the hard work that breaks people down. It's trying to work and function without power supernatural spiritual heavenly power we need the power of the holy spirit of god upon our lives and i pray that just as the early church got alone with god until god alone got all over them as we read in acts 1 as we read in acts 2 as we read in acts 4 and how the time after time they desired this fresh anointing and this indwelling of god that we as a body of christ that we as many members making one as we'll see here in just a moment would have the same desire for there to be an anointing a fresh and anew of the power of god upon our lives the truth of the matter is tonight, the reason mothers and wives are wore out and fatigued from the chores and the constant workload, the reason fathers and husbands are failing to be the men of God as they ought to be in their communities and in their families and being leaders of the home that they should be and young people growing exhausted from their schooling and their studies and preachers being feeble and dull in their sermons and even delivery, teachers fumbling with their lessons just trying to make it through just another class period and soul winners and servants of God being weary in the work and getting tired in the master's business. It's because they're seeking to toil without the touch of God. It's interesting, and not to be cute with a play of words, but it's true. The presence of God comes through yielding. But the power of God comes through yearning. You'll find that these disciples gathered in an upper room and they prayed and they tarried until they were able to get that power. Are you willing to labor in prayer for a week for the power of God? If that's how long it would take to get the anointing. Maybe it's 30 seconds. Maybe it's five minutes. But I believe tonight that if we wait on God and we long for that touch to be endued, as the Bible says, it's an illustrative term there in the book of Luke as a garment, a jacket that's being put on, the power of God resting upon your life. And I pray that it's something that it's obvious, it's visible, it's evident to those around you. They know that you are indwelt with this presence, but also anointed with this power that would be willing to not rush ahead of God, but that we would be willing to wait for that touch. I love what D.L. Moody said. He wrote this in 1881. 
He said this, and I quote uh, from a book he wrote entitled Secret Power. It's wonderful. It's a life-changing book. He said, some people seem to think that they are losing time if they wait on God for his power. And so away they go and work without unction. They are working without any anointing. They are working without any power. But after Jesus had said, receiving the Holy Ghost in John 20, 22, and had breathed on them, he said, now tarry ye in Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. Read in Acts 1.8, but ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And he continued to say, he said, do you think the scene would have taken place on the day of Pentecost if they did not come forth with power? We all know the answer tonight. The answer is no. But they tarried in Jerusalem. They waited 10 days. What, you say? The world is perishing and men are dying. Shall I wait? Do what God is telling you to do. There's no use in attempting to do God's work without God's power. A man working without this unction, a man working without this anointing, a man working without the Holy Ghost upon him is losing his time after all. And we are not going to lose anything if we tarry till we get this power. This is the object of true service. By the way, this is a man who is an example of it. Before modern technology, preaching to 100 million. Over a million souls coming to Christ through his preaching. I think he knew what he was talking about from personal experience. This is the true object of service. To wait on God and to tarry until we receive this power for ultimately witness bearing. He continued on with several stories and various things. And church, it's so true tonight. Um, God's work attempted in man's power and ability will be feeble. But God's work done with God's power will make, I believe this with every fiber of my being, it will make a supernatural impact. It will leave a lip, ripple effect into the generations to come. It will make an eternal difference. I believe that tonight. And I pray that every single member in this church, every single staff member, every single deacon and trustee and financial officer and person involved with the special music and every teacher, every single person a part of this ministry that you are desiring the indwelling of the Spirit, but also the anointing of the Spirit, all that we would have the fullness of him that we would desire him and the overabundance of him where it cannot be contained it is literally all over the place as the bible teaches the filling of the spirit as you study the word and dwelling in an anointing the fullness of his presence but also the fullness of his power our churches don't need trend or new ideas they need the touch of god we don't need the machinery of a well-trained and cultivated staff. We need the movement of heaven stirring our hearts and souls of men and women and young people and children in our congregations into a mighty Savior-seeking, soul-searching army. We don't need pulpit polish. Our churches need to feel the very real power of God upon their lives and in their midst again. Our churches don't need innovation. They need a visitation from a heavenly country for a sacred fire to consume them and work through them. Charles Spurgeon said this, it's the extraordinary power from God, not talent that wins the day. It's extraordinary spiritual unction, not extraordinary mental power that we need. Mental power may fill a chapel, but spiritual power fills the church with soul anguish. I'm concerned for far too long we're doing this. Scratching and tickling the back of ears. And we accuse the ecumenical people to doing it. That's what we're doing. Just making people feel good, yeah. We don't need to be tickling the back of ears. We need travail. This church will never experience the fullness of the outpouring of heaven unless every single part of this church desires God in all his fullness. I'm so thankful tonight that he has said, seek me and you shall find me. 
as we seek him with what? All of our heart. Are you seeking his presence in your life? Are you seeking his power upon your life? Charles Spurgeon said, mental power may gather a large congregation, but only spiritual power will burden, convict, and save souls. What we need is spiritual power, and I agree with Brother Spurgeon. God give us preachers and people who understand that the cause of Christ is not advanced by methods or programs, though we need good methods and we need good programs that are decisive. But listen, what our churches need and what God's people need to carry out his cause is the presence and power of the Holy Ghost. 1 Corinthians 2, you can put it on the screen, 1 Corinthians 2, verse number 4 and 5 says this, My speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of who? The Spirit and of what? Power. Many times, God uses the foolish things to confound the wise. He even says that he'll use the foolishness of preaching to cause the radical movement of heaven to commence in a service or in the midst of a congregation. I didn't come trying to entice you with some deep theological study to make you walk away and feel good about yourself. Now, we need to study the Word. Please don't misunderstand me tonight. Don't write a pendulum and go to the other side. I, I believe in being well-balanced. But he said, as I preached and as I persuaded and as I poured myself out, it was something in which you witnessed and you saw for yourself. Wow, that, what? The Spirit of God. The power of God working, moving through the service. I crave that. I long for this more than anything else in my life. Those of you that get our prayer text all the time, I'm asking for, and tonight I even asked, the anointing of the Holy Ghost, the power of God. Why? You don't need me coming in here trying to entice you. What you need is the Spirit of God working in your heart and working through me. I'm just but a vessel, and a vessel is something that is to be filled so it can be poured out. Every time I preach, I desire to pour out my cups and preach every single message as if it's my last, because it very well could be. It needs to be dripping and saturated, baptized with the power of God, or fully submersed, dunked underneath, hidden in the power of God. The next verse says, Why? That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men. Rather, you are who you are as a result of the power of God, and it's in the power of God. You do not need to live your life in wisdom. You need to live your life according to the power of God. 1 Corinthians 4.20, the Bible says, For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. Zechariah 4, verse number 6, the Bible says in Zechariah 4, 6, not by might, not by might or human might. In Zechariah 4, verse number 6, not by might, human might, nor by power or fleshly power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. And that generation was faced with an impossible task. They were overwhelmed. How, the, how on earth is this thing going to be going to be done? God sweetly came unto them, encouraging them, saying, My son, my people, it's by my spirit. I'm so thankful tonight, by the way. The same as we mentioned last night, Holy Spirit, that the early church had is the exact same Holy Spirit that we have this very day. The Holy Spirit of God. We may not have been at Pentecost. I wish I could have seen that. We live in the age of the Spirit, and you and I have the same Holy Ghost, and I passionately believe that we can see him mightily move and work as he once did in generations past, even at Pentecost, thousands of souls saved, people added to the church even daily, the work of God uh, being multiplied for his glory and the gospel's sake. I believe it's possible. Why? Because he's still the same. His presence has not withered away. You know, he's lost his grip on society. He's been at this thing for thousands of years, you know. He's just, he's tired. No. No. I would lift up mine eyes into the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth, Psalm 121. 
with him. Uh, hey, he doesn't slumber. He will not let my foot slip. Man, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and I'm so thankful for it. And I read, and I study, and I, I pine, really, in my spirit about how God did such wonderful works in yesteryear. And as I read it, I don't get discouraged. I get encouraged because, listen, it was wicked back then. It's wicked today. Sin was abounding back then. Sin abounds today. Apathy in the church was running rampant, and the services were ill-attended. Apathy runs rampant, and many times services are ill-attended, but the same God that struck a chord and shook the place and did something supernatural and mighty, marvelous, miraculous, is the exact same God that desires to do it today. Amen. So I go forward with faith, believing, with boldness, desiring for him to do it again. And I understand that the problem is never God, but it's always me. It's us. It's us. We're not yielded. We're not surrendered, all in, 110%, Jesus, only Jesus, crucified, allowing his spirit to indwell us, craving and praying. I'm not talking about working up into a frenzy. Oh, but you're willing to tarry and just be in the presence of God and desire. I, do, I crave that anointing, oh God. Please empower me to be able to go forward this day as I live for you and accomplish your will. Oh, the problem is never God. It's my sin. My self-centeredness, my carnality, my way, my will, my this, my that. We try to fit God into a box. I love what Leonard Ravenhill said. <laughs> and he, he was, what a, what a preacher, what a preacher. I look forward to going to heaven someday and meeting him. And uh, just a wonderful, wonderful man of God that the Lord used to stir revival fires. He said many times, churches, they come in at 11 and they go out at 12 and they say, Holy Spirit of God, come, but come our way. Don't violate our theology and don't uh, upset the status quo. Don't break our hearts with a, over a dying world. And, and we expect, he said, God to meet with us in the time that we have established. And then we expect him to leave us alone after we lock the back doors of the church. He said many of these things in his latter years. So he could get away with it. Amen. <laughs> his heart pined for God to do a work in his generation. I believe we all tonight, and even those who have joined by, by way of live stream, we all desire this. And may God continue to open up our eyes and our hearts and our minds and help us to live these crucified lives and to live a life in which we understand that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. The flesh has no ownership. It has no rights over my body, anything about my being, any member, any body part that I have, anything about me. It belongs to God. It's been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. It's been bought with the high price of His sacrifice. It is the dwelling place and the temple of the Holy Spirit. He deserves to have preeminence and his presence fully in me and through me. And he desires to anoint me. What could God do with a fully indwelt and anointed church? Jonathan Goforth, almost through. Jonathan Goforth declared this. He was a missionary of the past. He said, if revival is being withheld from us, it is because we still insist in placing our reliance in human schemes because we refuse to face the unchangeable truth that it's not by our might, but by his spirit. Someone once said this, could it be that we live in the age of the pretty church? <laughs> and the first class program church, but also in the age of the powerless church. I pray and I believe Lighthouse Baptist Church will be an exception. We will be a pretty church. Amen. He deserves riches, honor, glory, and blessing. He deserves to have things done first class. Not slipshod, half-hearted. Are you kidding me? With all of our might. The best that we can for his glory because he is worthy of receiving it but we will be known as a power-filled church I beg of you tonight and I don't think you'd take this the wrong way don't hinder this don't you be one that says well that's for so-and-so but you know I don't know about all that this is for all of us tonight the invitation is simple 
Have you fully yielded your life to God? Has there ever been a time, a crossroads, when you have surrendered your heart, your mind, your body to the Lord? And as you have laid yourself on the altar of sacrifice, you have stayed daily surrendered as Romans 12 teaches us to live. Verse number one and two. Is there anyone in this room, young people, adults, we have crawled off the altar of sacrifice and surrender and we've begun to try to coexist with God and we need to resurrender our lives fully to the Lord. Secondly, are there people in this room that need to begin to pray for the anointing of the power of the Holy Ghost? And desire this dunamis, this fire that should not be quenched to burn, to catch a world of flame. Heads about eyes are closed. I'm actually going to change things up tonight. Can my wife, is it okay if my wife plays on the piano? Could you play that song, Search Me, O God? Heads about eyes are closed. Don't look.